The gentlewoman from Hampton, Ms. Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a point of personal privilege. The gentlewoman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I am privileged to do a moment in black history, and I had a difficult time trying to come up with something meaningful for this year. And then with the passing of Justice Scalia in the middle of a heated presidential campaign, I was reminded that a president's term is relatively short, yet the appointment of a Supreme Court justice is one that results in pronouncements that have far-reaching implications and lifelong effects on the lives of black people that will span for generations. And it is for this reason that my moment in black history discusses some of the Supreme Court decisions that have had a profound impact, whether for good or for bad, on the lives of African Americans. And I think back first to 1850, when the Supreme Court heard the case of a fugitive named Dred Scott. He was a slave who was sold to a gentleman who lived in a free state. And when the master died, he sued the widow for his freedom, claiming that the residence, his residence on free soil made him a free man. The constitutional issue was whether a slave became free upon entering a free state. Is a slave entitled to sue the federal courts? And could an item of property, such as a slave, be taken from the owner without any type of compensation? Well, the court decided seven to two in favor of the slave owner. It was decided that African Americans, whether they be free or slaves, that they were not citizens and they had no rights to bring a suit to federal court. An even more serious consequence that the court also struck down the Missouri Compromise as unconstitutional because it deprived property owners or slave owners of the right to take their property anywhere in the United States. Then we move forward to a few years to Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. And this was during the aftermath of Reconstruction and the new state legislatures had enacted Jim Crow laws to legally segregate the races and to impose second-class citizenship upon African Americans. These laws created separate schools, separate waiting rooms, separate water fountains, and other segregated public accommodations. And in this case, Plessy versus Ferguson involved in a he was involved in a successful business in Louisiana, and he was living quite comfortably in society with both racial groups. Rach, uh, Plessy was considered to be white. And you know that African Americans come in so many different shades, different colors. However, Plessy had a grandparent who was African American, which meant that he was one eighth African American, which meant he was African American. And Plessy wanted to challenge the Dem Jim Crow laws, so he intentionally broke the law in order to initiate a case. He was returning uh, by train from New Orleans, and Plessy was asked by the railroad officials to sit in the segregated area of the train. He refused, and he was arrested and charged. He was uh, convicted and fined, and Plessy then appealed to the Supreme Court. Again, on a 7-1 decision, the court upheld the Louisiana law requiring segregation. It was agreed that the 14th Amendment was not intended to give African Americans social equality, but only political and civil equality with white people. So separate but not equal was the law of the land for the next 58 years. And that brings us to 1954, and things were about to change. Maybe it was because we had reached the end of World War II, and dramatic changes in American race relations were underway. 
Maybe it was the integration of different labor unions in 1930s and the desegregation of the armed forces that marked major steps towards racial integration. Or maybe, just maybe, I'm not saying this is true, but it was a year that I was born. <laughs> that meant it was going to be a landmark year. Perhaps no other case decided the, in the court in the 20th century was so profound as an effect on our social, on our social fabric than Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. Little girl, Linda Brown, eight years old, an African-American girl, was denied permission to attend an elementary school only five blocks from her home in Topeka. School officials refused to register her for a nearby school. Instead, they signed her to a school for non-white students some 21 blocks from her home. Linda Brown's parents filed a lawsuit to force the school to admit her to the nearby but segregated school for white students. Linda Brown's attorney, Thurgood Marshall, an NAACP litigator, who would later be appointed to the court in 1967, argued that the operation of separate schools based on race was harmful to African-American children. This time, it was a unanimous court decision, nine to zero. And Chief Justice Warren wrote that separate, to separate some children from others on similar age and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. With that decision, the world was ready for me. <laughs> and there is one final case that was brought before the Supreme Court that I believe has a profound effect on our lives today. On June 12, 1967, oral arguments in Loving versus Virginia were heard by the Supreme Court. This case presented a constitutional question never addressed in the court. Whether adopted by the state of Virginia to prevent marriages between persons solely on the basis of race violated the Equal Protection and Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. So, in 1958, two residents of Virginia, Mildred Jeter, a black woman, and Richard Loving, a white man, were married in the District of Columbia. They returned to Virginia to live in Caroline County. Now, you probably already know the story, but an indictment was issued charging the Lovings with violating Virginia's ban on interracial marriage. They pleaded guilty, and they were sentenced to one year in jail. However, the judge suspended their sentence for a period of 25 years on the condition that the Lovings leave the state and not return to Virginia for another 25 years. The judge's opinion was, Almighty God created races, white, black, yellow, and red, and he placed them all on separate continents, and but for the interference with his arrangements, there would be no cause for races to mix. It's, it was really hard to believe, and even less hard, um, less, it was difficult to even read on this floor what our state statute said in reference to marriage between white persons and colored persons. It was not one of our finest hours, but in 1967, the Supreme Court's unanimous decision to no longer prevent marriages between different races included Justice Stewart saying, it's simply not possible for a state law to be valid under our Constitution, which makes the criminality of an act depend upon the race of the persons. 
Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, these are only a few of the rulings made by the Supreme Court over the years. But as you can easily see, they have all had a profound effect on our lives, either for good or for bad, but especially in the lives of African Americans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.